I want now to get into the um, doctrine of sin, which is called homarchiology in theological terms. Um, next week we're going to spend an hour doing the other half of this class, which is on soteriology. Soteriology is based on the word soter, which means savior. You know the ichthus, um, the um, ichthus symbol? Ichthus is the Greek word for fish. Well, ichthus in the early Christians, especially during time of persecution in the first couple of centuries, um, was an acronym. It stood for Iesus Christos Theos, su, uh, Theos Huyos Soter, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Iesus Christos Theos Huyos Soter. Soter, the last word, which means Savior, is the basic root for soteriology. Well, hamartiology, which is really the thing that you, you need to have some sense of before you get onto soteriology, is the doctrine of sin, what sin is, how it exists in us. It is from the Greek word hamartia, which means missing the mark, and logia, which is the study of. So it's the study of missing the mark. Sin is described in the Bible as missing the mark, the mark being the goal of perfection that is set before us as children of God. Uh, the basis for our understanding of sin it goes back to original sin. The idea that sin is inherited from our original ancestors who rebelled against God, and so it is a pervasive plague for all of humanity over all time. The best way to understand sin is as an illness. It is a disease, a plague that has been inherited over time from our most ancient ancestors. Scripture describes them as Adam and Eve. Whether there were two particular individuals named Adam and Eve that were created you know, instantaneously, or whether God anointed two beings with a self-awareness so that they became in the image of God at that point and then they chose to betray God's love and his, his relationship doesn't really matter to me. God, God designed it, God put it in motion, um, and our most ancient ancestors decided against God and sin came into the world at that point. That is the doctrine of original sin. If you'd like more detail on original sin, you can go back to the Old Testament description of this in the Old Testament theology classes that are online, of course. You can see the videos. Um, and Psalm 51.5, again quoting the Old Testament, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. That seems like a very simple verse, but the very idea that sin existed from the point of conception, obviously um, an embryo at the point of conception has not yet done anything wrong has not yet committed any vile acts, has not yet sinned, and yet sin exists at that point. So it comes from somewhere into the human soul at the point of conception. And there are other passages about that as well. Um, now, I want to... Original sin is the basic doctrine that the church has maintained as being the doctrine of um, our belief about how sin comes into the world. It's a doctrine that's, that most significantly was articulated uh, by, guess who, Augustine, my man, Augustine, <laughs> I know. Um, and, you know, Augustine was the most influential to Calvin, who formed Reformed Theology and everything else, so Augustine really is so foundational in so many things that we, we uh, maintain. Now, will you be talking about him in the church history class next I will term? be talking about Augustine in the church history <laughs> class next term, <laughs> mostly about Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> Just an unbelievable thinker, great man of God, and really honest about everything. I mean, it was a guy, and sometimes funny. It was Augustine who said that when he came to a knowledge of Christ, he said that he was having, he was a very immoral young man. He slept around a lot, and so when he became a Christian, he said, "Lord, make me chaste, but not yet." Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, 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 he tells it like it is. This is from the Confessions, the world's first autobiography. Well, there is an alternative view to, to our standard doctrine of original sin. I could almost say that this doctrine of original sin could be called an August, the Augustinian doctrine of sin. Because it was Augustine. It is in Scripture. It's very clearly in Scripture. But Augustine was the one that really articulated it theologically and then defended it. Well, the one he defended it against was a guy named Pelagius, who also lived in the same time, in the 400s. And Pelagius came up with what's called the Pelagianism, or the Pelagian heresy, to be quite blunt about it. Pelagius said that Adam, our ancient ancestor, only, and I'm quoting here, set a bad example 
for his descendants. And then consequently, Jesus set the good example, contrary to that, and that original sin did not taint subsequent <coughs> human nature so that people are still capable of choosing good and evil without help from God. In other words, I am not a sinful creature by nature, that I basically am good, and that I can choose good, that I may choose evil, and then society may push me toward choosing evil. That's a very modern kind of idea that, okay, if people are bad, it's just because they haven't been treated very well, and they don't respond well, and so they do bad things. That's not the Christian doctrine. The Christian doctrine is that I am born with sin. I am born broken. Um, some of you have heard me talk about my old friend, Tim Waits. Tim was, um, when I graduated from college, I stuck around my college campus because it was a Christian fellowship that I was involved in leadership with. And Tim, uh, I lived in a house with several roommates. And Tim was one of the roommates. He was not a Christian at the time. But he was a really good guy, and he was an honest seeker. And so he was visiting all these other different religious groups on the college campus where we were. And he went to the Baha'i Fellowship, I remember. It was right after the Baha'i Fellowship, I think we talked about this. And Tim came back to me and he said, you know, I go to these different groups, like the Baha'is I was just talking to, and they all tell me that I'm basically good, that I'm a good being, that as a human being I'm good inside, and that just bad things happen to me. And Tim said, you know, I hear that, and I think to myself, if I'm basically good, why is it so hard to be good and so easy to be bad? <laughs> Tim was yeah. right. Our natural inclination is toward evil, because we are, by nature, sinful. Pelagius, the church has always maintained since those early days, and Pelagius and Augustine debated, Augustine by far winning, Pelagian, uh, the Pelagian doctrine was considered to be heresy. That no, it's not just you know that we're all okay, we can choose good, we're not stained by original sin, but rather that we are uh, broken and that we are stained by the sin that came down from our ancestors. All right. Um, let's see where I am here. There's a, a third doctrine I should mention, which is called semi-Pelagianism, which is halfway in between. It's trying to sort of compromise. It basically says that to compromise between Pelagius and Augustine, it makes a distinguish uh, a distinction between choosing good initially, a choice of faith to choose to be uh, toward God, and then increasing in that faith. Semi-Pelagianism says we have the power to choose in favor of good, that is, in favor of God and Jesus Christ. But then once we make that initial choice, we don't have the power to advance or increase in that faith, that that then is a gift of God. So it says we take the first step, and then God will help us after that. Um, whereas Pelagius said it's all up to us, and Augustine said you are in sin. You can't do anything apart from the initial grace of God, that God reaches down to you. You don't climb up to him, which to me is a fundamental doctrine of faith. So, that brings us to the question, I think, uh, sort of backing up here, uh, what is sin? A good definition, I believe, is sin in a creature, um, anything in a creature which does not express or which is contrary to the holy character of God. You'll notice that there's nothing in that definition that has to do with doing anything wrong, necessarily. It is anything in us or any other creature which does not express or which is contrary to the holy character of God. God being the standard toward which we are to achieve or desire to achieve. We're not going to get there. Jesus said, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Not because he expected us to really become perfected, but rather because by seeking to be perfect, we will be better than we would otherwise, you know, shoot for the, the highest goal. When you say that God is the perfection toward which we are to achieve, then you understand why hamartiology is, means missing the mark. The mark is the perfection of God. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we shoot for. We're not going to get there, but we will do much better if we're shooting for that mark. Yes, Mary? When you, <clears throat> when you say creature, does that imply that other than human beings can sin? It, it means a created beings. I don't think other creatures can sin. I could say person here, but uh, th this actually isn't my definition. I took oh. it from something else. But uh, I believe it means a person. Anything in a person that does not express which is kind of the character of God. Yes? Well, when, then what does it mean when it says all creation is fallen? Not well, just uh, human. all creation is, um, is afflicted by the result of sin. That doesn't mean <clears throat> that creation sin. You know, the lions and tigers and bears did not commit sin, 
in order to be, you know, to, to then eat small children. Uh, that's a result of the sin of humanity. We were the ones that caused the fall. And all of creation fell with us. Um, and so the brokenness that exists in the world, so that there is violence and there is, you know, death and there is grief and there is pain and there are natural disasters and all of that, is the impact on creation of humanity <coughs> having chose against, chosen against God. Okay? Only we can sin, but the original sin of our ancestor affected all of creation. All of creation has fallen. That's why there is so much violence in the world, even in the natural world. Red and tooth and fang, as they used to say. Um, okay, now, was there another question? Okay. I got my head. <laughs> you're just trying to get that, you, you're trying to get in the camera. That's what it is. Because it's right over your head. Ah, yeah, <laughs> <you're> <laughs> That's all right. So, um, sin, I want to make a distinction here. Sin with a capital S is our spirit of rebellion against God that is placed in us as part of our humanity, inherited or imputed from our ancient ancestors. That plague of sin that I'm talking about. It is a cancer, an illness, a disease, which has been passed down to us as part of our humanity. Now, believing that, that's the doctrine, the standard doctrine of, of the Christian faith. And that's why I said I, I tend toward, I, I'm open to being corrected by the Lord, but I tend more toward the Traducian, um, doctrine of the where the soul comes from because that to me makes more sense as to how imputed sin is conveyed into the soul of a of an infinite conception than the creationism approach to where the human soul comes from because we believe that that our spirit um, of rebellion against God comes to us from uh, as part of our humanity inherited or imputed from our ancient ancestors okay now as opposed to that sins with a small s are the particular acts that we commit which reflect the sinful nature that is in us. Sin is the thing that we, in effect, are, that is in us, that's part of us, the brokenness that exists in us. Sins, small s, plural, are the particular ways in which those, that sinfulness gets manifested by us doing bad things. Another way to say it is that we are not sinners because we commit sin. We commit sins because we are sinners. You get the difference? All right. The the sins, the, the, the bad things we do, the sins we commit are an, out, an outward expression of the brokenness that's inside us, not the other way around. It's not like we do bad things and that makes us bad people. We are bad people. That causes us to do bad things. That's the doctrine of original sin. Martin? Well, even the garden chose to disbelieve God when Satan said, you shall not truly die, but you will be like God. And exactly. To be desired. And I think all of us from then on have a, a desire to be either there is no God, or we are our own God, or we find, make our own gods, but we are not going to look for the Creator or our God above us. There's no other. Right. Us. We want to be first. I mean, you know, I'm the center of the whole world. They, the, the original sin, you're exactly right, the original sin was to want to be like God in ways that we're not allowed to be like God. That we are not supposed to be like God. We are in the image of God, and there are ways, as we just talked about, in which we are like God, but in terms of having His power, His authority, uh, of truly being like God in every other way, that is not for us to have. And yet, Eve was tempted by that, and all of us, I want to... You know, I don't want anybody else to be the boss of me, even God in heaven. Okay. And so, perhaps as an as a, as a child, we don't. It doesn't manifest itself yet, but when we're old enough to understand, that's part of us. Yeah, I mean, it, we we want to be in charge. Well, I think it does manifest itself often in little kids. Oh, yeah. We realize um, Tim Snow, who's one of the pastors, he was the executive pastor of our church in Seattle. He had a little girl, Annie, and he said one day that Annie wanted to do something, and, and it was. I don't remember what it was. I don't know what it was. And Tim said, no, you can't do that. And she said, but I want to do that. And he said, no, you can't. Now, she was like three. He said she planted her feet and put her hands on her hips and said, but I want what I want. <laughs> okay, little kids are just like that. And we're just like that. Um, that is the nature of, you know, we, it doesn't matter whether the, the person right, who is rightfully in authority over us, be it our parents or God, tells us, no, we still want what we want. We want to be in charge. We want to call the shots. We want to be God. That was the temptation to Eve. It's the temptation still to us today. And that 
The reason why that is a temptation to us today is because of the presence of imputed original sin in us, that we are by nature sinners. And that results in us doing sinful things, not the other way around. You, you all get the difference. This is a fundamental <coughs> aspect of the doctrine of sin. You're not a sinful creature because you commit sins. You commit sins because you're a sinful creature. And you started out at conception, I quote this, this again, at the moment of conception, you were full of sin. Okay, Marvin? Someone said that it's not so much that we missed the mark, but some of us actually turned the other direction and are shooting the opposite direction. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, now, there's, I want to give you a little bit of background in terms of the doctrine of original sin. First, the original uh, the sin began not with Adam and Eve. Sin began in the angelic realm with the pride and fall of Satan. Because before Satan tempted Eve, Satan himself <coughs> fell victim to pride. Isaiah 14, 12 to 15 says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. The morning star is one of the names for Lucifer, the angel of light, who we know as Satan, which literally means the adversary. The morning star is Venus, and the planet Venus. It's called the morning star because part, part of the time of the year, the Venus rises before the moon does. Um, it's the morning star. And so, and some, sometimes in the year, it's the last star that you see uh, after the, the moon is set before morning comes. And Venus has always been associated as the, be the beautiful planet of Venus with Satan, with Lucifer, the angel of light, the most beautiful of all the angels, okay? So, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave to the depths of the pit. This was the pride of Satan who desired to be like God, to compete with God. And yet he was a created being and was not able to pull it off. Jude 6 and 7 says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home, these he kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5 says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, he goes on and says, he, you know, basically, he won't allow you to get away with stuff either. He's going to judge the angels. You will be judged for sinning as well. Um, so we have a very clear picture that before creation even, the angelic beings sinned by competing with God because of pride. That's where it started. You guys have heard my Billy Graham invitation? You all heard no. it? Okay. Uh, the, the said with, with regard to the angels, you know, one, one third of the angels, it said, uh, traditionally, fell with, and actually the Revelation says one third of the stars were swept in the sky. So the idea being one third of the angels sided with Satan when he competed with God and failed and were fallen. That's where the demons come from. The old, uh, one guy said, uh, Billy Graham said, when Satan fell, one third of the angels fell with him. You know what that means? We got him outnumbered, two to one. <laughs> okay, thank you for indulging me. And he's got it. Another answer. Oh, yes, Suzanne. Just a question. Uh, I think it's in Revelation that. That Christ is called, but Jesus is called a bright morning star. Bright morning star. Right. That's different than this. Yes. Yeah. This is not it's a interesting. That it's just called a morning star. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's one of the many names for Jesus, and I, I never even thought about that. The fact that, that Satan is called the morning star, but again, that's associated with the planet of Venus, the Lucifer, the angel of light, and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, now, from the sin of the angels. We then come to the sin, uh, the original sin, that is from Adam and Eve. The idea that in Adam we all fell from grace, that original sin for us began there. From Romans 5, Paul writes, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that is Adam, and death through sin, death was the result of our sin against God, Adam and Eve sin against God. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned, for therefore the law was given, sin was in the world. 
But sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. Okay, even those who did not sin by breaking a command had sin because we inherited it from Adam. This is where the idea of original sin imputed to us by our ancient ancestor comes from. There are other places as well, but this is one place. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. In other words, Adam and Eve sinned once in violating the trust that God had for them, and sin came into the world. But no matter how many sins there have been or trespasses, the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ covered all of those. Okay. For if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive Christ's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, original sin because of the first sin of Adam and Eve, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Apparently Pelagius never said this. <laughs> Because it says several times here that the sin of Adam and Eve was imputed to us so that we all became sinners because of that. Um, this is the doctrine is of original sin is based upon this and other places. Um, another place, whoops, what happened? What happened? Could you click that back up? Sorry about that. You could. I didn't. You did. You got it. Uh, I can take us back to where we need to be. Do, do, do. I thought I clicked from current slide. Coffee, not really. Well, you did, but I had it on the other slide. I didn't touch it. No, I did. I, I, it goes. It's really fast. This is very sensitive, and I clicked past, and that's what that is. Okay, this one. In Adam, we all fell from grace, original sin. Two more passages from Romans. Romans being the great theological treatise of Paul. Romans 3, 9 to 12, we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. All people are under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have all together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. This is what my friend Tim Waits was saying. If I am inherently good, like everybody keeps trying to tell me, because nobody wants to say, admit they're bad, right? We all want to be good, but we're not. As Tim said, if it's so easy to be good, why, why is it so hard to be good and so easy to be bad? Okay, there's no one who does good, not even one. And Romans 3.23, the most powerful, probably, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we have imputed sin, and then we also reflect that in sinning in our lives. Now, there's actually three <coughs> kinds of sin that theology, the doctrine of homardiology, is identified. The first one is what's called inherited sin. Which means because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the basic depravity, the brokenness, is inherited from our original ancestors. Very closely associated with that is the, doc the second kind of sin, which is imputed sin. Imputed means that, that uh, similar to that, the first one, uh, inherited sin, means our inclination to sin is part of the inheritance. The imputed sin means we actually bear the responsibility for what Adam and Eve did. It's not just that we inherited the tendency to depravity, which is the, the idea of inheritance in, but it was actually imputed to us. We actually bear the burden to pay the cost for the sin of Adam and Eve. And the third kind of sin um, is the, the personal sin, which are the things we actually do. Those are the sins I commit. So the three kinds of sin, inherited sin, I inherited the tendency to depravity and sin from Adam and Eve, my ancestors, and from my parents. The imputed sin that I bear the plague of responsibility for what Adam and Eve did when they sinned. And then the actual personal sin, my, my, in my own sinning, you know, from the first squall out of my mouth when I was born, I was plotting bad stuff. Okay, that's my personal sin. 
That's a confession. Some little kids that are so good you can't imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah just wait. <laughs> <laughs> they want what they want when they want it. Exactly. I mean, that's it starts, what I want. It starts All children are not like that. So inherited sin, imputed sin, and personal sin are the three types of sin which are all part of the, the doctrine of original sin in homardiology. Uh, again, um, Romans 5.12, just, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all have sinned. We inherited it from Adam and Eve. Um, I'm not going to go too much longer. I mean, you guys deserve a break. This is heavy stuff. I think that, uh, let me just, I'm going to close up with this and then take some questions uh, and remember what Aristotle said about questions. <laughs> Why do we talk about sin? I mean, if we as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, if we pay the price for our sin, and original sin is no longer, we're no longer victimized by that plague, why do we need to study this? And particularly, we're doing this as prepar in preparation for the study of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. How do we get saved? And what does that even mean? Well, the doctrine, uh, before we can really study or understand the doctrine of salvation, I believe we have to understand why we need salvation. <coughs> what is it about us? And, and this actually, the, I said when I started this section, this is a direct feed from the anthropology, our understanding of what it means to be human. Part of what our understanding of what it means to be human is, is that we are creatures who are born in sin. We are of original sin. When we understand that is part of our anthropology, that's part of what it means to be a human being, that we are burdened with original sin, only then can we have a clear understanding of what salvation means. If someone doesn't know that they need salvation, then they're not going to understand salvation, and they're not going to receive it. Until you know you have a disease, you're not going to re you're not going to seek the cure. Okay, that that's fundamentally homardiology is giving us a clear picture of where we're broken, so that we then can see in soteriology. These are theological terms for it. We can uh, understand how it is we get unbroken, how it is we get saved. Um, Hamardiology, the doctrine of sin, explains how and why we are all sinners by inheritance, by imputation, by our own personal choices. Uh, and then Hamardiology points us directly toward the solution for our sins, the soteriology, the savior part of it, and that is the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we need to truly come to grips with our own sinful nature, to recognize that I am a sinner before God and I need to be forgiven in order to then receive the benefits of the atoning sacrifice. Joe? But you haven't mentioned the fact about free will. Now, where okay. does this fit into it? That, we're going to talk about that next week when we talk about soteriology. We're going to talk about free will and predestination as part of what it means to be saved and how the how salvation happens. Thank you. Okay? So we will get to that. I haven't asked, I forgot that you asked about predestination. So we will talk about that. This part of it, we're just recognizing our sinfulness. The issue of free will or predestination and how those fit together have to do with how we get saved. Okay. Um, so once we can fathom the, the depth and breadth of our sinful nature before a merciful God who wants to save us, but who also will eventually condemn sinners to, you know, to condemnation, until we come to an understanding of that, we can't really talk about salvation. We can't really understand what it means for Jesus Christ to have saved us. Um, we understand the depth of our sin, then we can understand the height of God's love for us as sinners. Questions about any of that or comments? You're all now home archaeologists. Yes, Mary. <laughs> this is probably next week also, but at one time, uh, obviously, Satan had free will and he decided to go his own way. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, a third of the angels. <laughs> but uh, there's, after that, the angels did not have free will, or that was. They did. They, the, the other two thirds chose God. They chose to maintain that relationship and continue to. We don't have, I don't think there's a theological, I mean, somebody's probably written on it, they've written on everything. The question of whether or not any angels fell subsequent to that. Did any, any angels after that decide? Uh, we have no knowledge of that. We have no indication of that. We only have a description and knowledge of the first fall where Satan motivated one third of the angels to fall. Uh, but angels, by definition, they're the only creatures other than us that do have free will. 
you know, that have the ability to choose for or against God. You know, God did not create a world where evil and sin existed, but God created a world where free choice was necessary. You can't love unless you have free choice. It's not possible. So to create a universe where real love was possible, then free choice had to be possible. And choice, free choice meant we could choose against God. And that's what Satan did, that's what one third of the angels outside of the Satan did, and that's what Adam and Eve did. And today that's what many other people do. They choose against God. Yes, Charlie. So is uh, in uh, where Noah was preparing the ark mm -hmm. and it, God had said that the that the angels were marrying with the the, the Nephilim, okay. Yeah, yeah. The Nephilim. <laughs> Nobody really understands that passage. In the in the Noah times, for those of you who don't know what uh, Darling's referring to there, it says that the sons of men married the Nephilim, or I'm sorry, married the, the, you know, the, daughters, the daughters of men. Yeah, yeah. Daughter, daughters of men married the yeah. angels, is it? Or whatever. Yeah. And then and they produced the Nephilim, who were the giants in those days. We don't know really what that means. We don't know if it actually was possible for human beings to intermarry with demons, basically fallen angels, and that the result were some sort of hybrid monsters who were called the giants. That's one of those that uh, there's a long line of people who are going to wait and try to get the answer to that one when they get that. That's, uh, now, the, the whole Nephilim thing is a real mystery. We really don't understand. I'm never going to try to tell you that I understand something that I don't, especially when nobody understands it. You know, it's too easy to catch me. Uh, Anything else? All right. 